So usually people behave in ways that are consistent with their attitudes, but this isn't always the case. So let's take a look at two theories that try to figure out why these inconsistencies exist. So the first of these theories is called the Elaboration Likelihood Model. I like to call it the ELM model for short. Now this model is based on the cognitive component of attitudes. We talked about before how there's three components of attitudes. The affective or the emotional, the behavioral, and the cognitive. So the cognitive approach is founded on our beliefs, on information that we acquire to shape attitudes. Now the ELM model also focuses on persuasion. And the reason I say persuasion is because in order to shift our attitude, thus shift our behavior, we have to be persuaded somehow. We have to have a degree and shift in our attitude. So there's two ways that an attitude change can occur. And the ELM model says the first way it occurs is through a central route. So the central route says the degree of attitude change depends on the quality of the argument presented by the persuader. So the quality is more important. How well does the persuader present the facts? Does it sound really good? Does he sound as if he knows what he's talking about? All of those factors is going to possibly cause a shift in our attitude. And the second route is called the peripheral route. And this is a little different. The peripheral route says that a degree and shift in attitude depends on superficial persuasion cues presented by the presenter or the persuader. So what do I mean by superficial? I basically mean that these cues have no depth to them. They're very shallow. That's exactly what it is. We're subconsciously looking to see if the persuader presents cues such as attractiveness, expertise, or status. So when someone's trying to change your attitude, or we're looking for a way to change your attitude to make it consistent with behavior, we're going to be looking for cues in both of these routes to kind of help and shape that. So pretend you're sitting at home one night watching TV, and you're flipping through channels and stumble across the news channel, and you notice they're airing the presidential debate. Now you really don't care enough about politics, but you figured it's probably important to understand where these candidates stand. So the first candidate is speaking, giving his debate and his argument, and you notice that the quality of his argument is really good. He seems to know what he's talking about, he rebuts and refutes appropriately, and even though your stance on some of his topics were different before, it seems as if they could be changing because of how well he presented his argument, the quality of it. Now subconsciously, you're also looking for a total package deal here. You're looking for the superficial cues, such as how well he presents himself physically, attractiveness, does he seem to have good expertise or seems like he has some experience in what he's talking about? What about the status of his f educational background and does he come from a good family? These are all cues that make up the whole package and could possibly cause a shift in your attitude. And in this case, it would cause a shift in your attitude on the stance of some sort of presidential debate topic. So moving on from that theory, the second theory is called the cognitive dissonance theory. And this theory says that we change our own attitudes depending or not if we notice an inconsistency in our attitudes. So in dissonance is just a fancy word for saying an inconsistency. So as humans, we love harmony. We don't like it when things are out of order. We like it when things are in sync. 
I don't know how many of you can agree with me, but I like it when my thoughts, words, and deeds are all aligned and I'm on the same page about all of those things. So when we notice an inconsistency or a discrepancy or a dissonance, whatever you want to call it, we want to be able to reduce it. We want to get rid of it in some way. It just bothers us. We don't have, we have a drive to acquire harmony. So basically, we can reduce this dissonance in three ways. And the first way, the theory says, is simple change. Just change your behavior or change your attitude. Simple as that. The second is acquiring new information to support an attitude. So we talked about how the cognitive approach deals with activating information or knowledge to mold an attitude. So this is exactly where this part comes from. And the third, which is less common, is called trivializing the inconsistency. So what do I mean by trivializing? I mean that we want to suppress the inconsistency, make it seem like it's not there, not as important. Now this is less common of the three and will probably be used if the other two don't work in fixing an inconsistency. So basically, when I think of this theory, I think of one thing, and that is a hypocrite. I mean, we don't like being hypocrites, and I don't think anyone likes coming across a hypocrite. We don't like people who practice or behave one way and then say and think in another way. So that is an inconsistency between thought or action and attitude. So just remember the cognitive dissonance theory can be associated in a really simple term as a hypocrite. And both of these theories together help us understand shifts in attitude and how the attitude can ultimately change and shift our behavior.